Welcome to Journey to Esquire, the podcast. I'm Jocelyn Hardrick, founder and president of Diversity Access Pipeline, Inc., the company behind this podcast and other great programs like Journey to Esquire Scholarship and Leadership Program, which provides $2,000 cash scholarships to third-year law students and internships to second-year law students, along with leadership training and mentors. And Journey to Esquire, the blog, which provides insightful articles to help navigate you through law school and beyond. Find out more on our website, www.journeytoesquire.com. Hey, have you heard about Anchor? It's the easiest way to make a podcast. Let me explain. It's free. There's creation tools that let you record and edit your podcast right from your phone or computer, just like I'm doing now. Anchor will distribute your podcast for you, so you can hear it on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and more. You can make money from your podcast with no minimum listenership. It's everything you need to make a podcast all in one place. Download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. This is Jocelyn Hardrick. I'm so excited to share this segment with you because it's a project I've been working on for a couple of years. I've sat in on a lot of panel discussions and meetings and presentations by the voluntary bar associations all over Tampa Bay and have heard such great stories about the pioneering African-American lawyers in Tampa Bay. So I decided I wanted to start recording some of their stories and doing personal interviews. And it's a lot of work. It's very rewarding, but I definitely could use some help. And so I've just put together this little snippet of the, some of the interviews I've done to see if anyone else is interested in learning more and helping out. To find out more information, please go to www.journeytoesquire.com forward slash oral history. Enjoy. Journey to Esquire, an oral history. A discussion of the life and times of civil rights era pioneering African-American lawyers in Tampa Bay, Florida. Why talk about the journey? Pioneering African-American lawyers are retiring and are reflecting on their legacies. It is an opportune time to capture their stories in their own words. What is an oral history? One, a recording containing information about the past obtained from in-depth interviews concerning personal experiences, recollections, and reflections. Also, the study of such information. Two, a written work based on oral history. MiriamWebster.com The Importance of Oral History A quote, Oral history shows you that there is more than one perspective and that there are multiple stories in history. History is usually done from the perspective of your old, white, rich, and male. It's more diverse than that. There are other stories that need to be shared and perspectives that are just as valuable that need to be in the history books. Adrian Kane, Assistant Director of the Institute for Oral History at Baylor University. The African American Oral Tradition Lift every voice. The Florida Bar recently profiled James Weldon Johnson, most famous for penning the words to the affectionately nicknamed Negro National Anthem, Lift Every Voice and Sing. Johnson was a prominent lawyer, writer, and educator. He was the first African-American lawyer admitted to the Florida Bar after Reconstruction. This oral history is an answer to his call to, quote, sing a song full of the faith that the dark past has taught us. Sing a song full of the hope that the present has brought us. One famous lawyer who inspired many. Justice Thurgood Marshall rose to fame in his work for civil rights all over the South on behalf of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, NAACP. He was a source of inspiration for many young people who would later become pioneering lawyers. Mr. Marshall goes to Florida. 
Marshall inspired Delano Stewart, Parthenia L. Joyner, and Donald R. Odom, and countless others to become lawyers. Marshall conducted many trials in Florida in his fight for civil rights under the law. His most talked about and dangerous case took place right in Tampa Bay's backyard in Groveland. A quote, in the post-war decade, Florida would prove to be a state with a boundless capacity for racial inhumanity, even by measure of the rest of the South. Devil in the Grove, Thurgood Marshall, The Groveland Boys, and The Dawn of a New America by Gilbert King. The case of The Groveland Boys made national news at the time, had a significant impact upon the NAACP's goals for future litigation, and is now the subject of an award-winning book. It took place in Florida, a state that somehow escaped the bad reputation attributed to Mississippi, Georgia, or Louisiana, even though it had a higher per capita lynching rate. From the Black History Month review of The Devil in the Grove by Gilbert King, Rhapsody in Books weblog. Delano Stewart, Esquire, Hillsborough County, Florida. Mr. Stewart was the first African-American elected to the Board of Directors of the Hillsborough County Bar Association and member of the Rough Riders Civic Club. Mr. Stewart is a founding member of Tampa's predominantly African-American George Edgecombe Bar Association and the Tampa Organization of Black Affairs. Mr. Stewart mentored pioneers Frank H. White, second African-American judge in Pinellas County history, George Edgecombe, Hillsborough County's first African-American assistant county solicitor, assistant state attorney, and judge, among others. Milestones along the way for Delano Stewart. In 1936, he was born in Hillsborough County, Florida. In 1948, he meets Thurgood Marshall, who would become the first African-American Supreme Court Justice. At the time, Marshall was visiting Tampa as an NAACP attorney, helping African-American teachers campaign for equal pay. In 1965, just months after graduating from Howard University School of Law in Washington, D.C., he became the first African-American board member for the Hillsborough County Young Democrats. In 1966, he became the first African-American assistant public defender in Hillsborough County. In 1970, he hired Martin Lawyer III and created Florida's first racially integrated law firm. In 2015, Mr. Stewart retired from the practice of law. Video Clip, Delano Stewart. If you develop the following four things, CICI, character, integrity, courage, and intelligence, you won't fail. And you have to utilize that in life, remembering that any day that you have and you have the ability to do something, it is not you. It's the talents that God gave you. And what I am afraid of, and I've seen it happen so many times, the climb of a mountain is steep, long, and rigorous. You fall off it in a second. You cannot cheat life. You think you may cheat life. And I, I make an example out of somebody who I ate and was his good friend and helped him up. And he lost a second district court of appeal judgeship. He got his license taken. And I was on the uh, committee. I was chairman of the committee and I had to do strategic thinking because on that nine person committee that I was chairman I was the only black person. There were three vacancies and uh, they were whispering we could send one up and the other two. two. Well, what they were trying to do, there were three blacks and they were trying to narrow them down. I called Lawton Childs, who was the governor at that time, and I said, I need a telegram saying you would like all nine names at one time. I stopped by the Cancun store that morning. I got a brand new white cap, never been worn. So we, the first vote was to narrow the committee to nine. We had 10 people, and we narrowed it to the nine, and the three blacks were still in. So this is what are we going to do now? Uh, I, I, I would like to move that we send three up 
that motion is out of order. Whip got the telegram from Lawton and presented it. So that's gone. So I said, well, how, how, how are we going to do this? I said, we got the nine names. And we were scrambling up, but we still got the white hat and put it on. Each one of you put a name in, and we shook them up, and then we took them out. One, two, three. The Honorable Peggy Quince was in one. One, two, three. That was a black lawyer from, and so that left the only one in Tom Stringer. So I got the opportunity to send nine names a black person being in every one of them. I had a lot of accolades heaped on me. How did you do that deal? Yeah, it was political maneuver. Well, critical thinking and prayer. Because I couldn't make one being each one of the things. It was a gamble. But once I got them down, I trusted God enough to believe that in that white, brand new Cancun hat that had never been worn, that a black would be in each one of them. And <laughs> one was. And I, I have been praised about uh, my maneuvering, but I know in the, the essence of reality, but for the Lord on my side, I couldn't have done it that way. A quote, my philosophy teacher once said, you will die, there is no alternative. You do not control when that will be, but you can control how you live. That sums up life. If you pursue things you believe in, death, is inconsequential. Delano Stewart. Mr. Stewart is working on a book tentatively titled The Negro Lawyer, documenting his times, tribulations, and triumphs during his life and career. Arthenia L. Joyner Esquire, Polk County, Florida. Ms. Joyner attended Florida A&M University receiving her bachelor's and juris doctor degree. She was twice arrested for protesting as part of the civil rights movement. Ms. Joyner received the National Black Caucus of State Legislators Lifetime Achievement Award and the President's Award from Florida A&M University. She was inducted into the Hillsborough Women's Hall of Fame in 2014. Ms. Joyner is the longest practicing African-American woman lawyer in the history of Florida. Milestones along the way for Arthenia L. Joyner. In 1943, she was born in Lakeland, Florida. In 1969, she became a legal assistant to State Representative Joe Lane Kershaw, became a founding partner in the law firm of Stewart, Joyner, and Jordan Holmes, and the first African-American female lawyer practicing in Polk and Hillsborough counties. In 1984, she became president of the National Bar Association, the historically African-American National Lawyer Association. She was arrested for her role in a protest against apartheid during her tenure. In 1991, she was appointed to the Hillsborough County Aviation Authority by Governor Lawton Childs, on which she served as the first African-American board member. In 1995, she was appointed by President Bill Clinton to serve as the American representative at the United Nations Fourth World Conference on Women in Beijing. In 2006, she became a state senator for Florida's 18th district. Elected as Senate floor leader for the Democrats, she would leave the state legislature in 2016 due to term limits. Video clip, Arthenia L. Joyner. You know, as I reflect back on my childhood, I remember when I was a kid, and I was born in Lakeland, Florida. And my father owned a business and it was situated near our home. And I remember one day he came in and he said, close the door and pull the blinds. The Klan's gonna march. And I was either four or five, maybe three, but it was so distinct, so my mom shut the door and pulled the shades. We didn't have blinds, we had shades. And she pulled the shades down and he said, the Klan is gonna march and 
I want everything closed down in here. And so it happened. And then the Klan marched and we peeped slightly out the window and saw all these men with robes and white hoods on, white robes and hoods over their faces. So this was my first encounter with vivid displays of intimidation because as a young black girl I had you know been told and I lived in a segregated society then and I've been told that these men who wore these white robes and white hoods were dangerous and that we should you know not be anywhere near where they were so somewhat of a frightening experience but the day passed and they moved on but that was the beginning that was the beginning of the realization uh, of the introduction of me to to what it was like to be afraid of of people who hid their faces a quote I tell younger people, your word is your bond and to let your word speak for you. You don't have to follow the crowd to be successful, but you do have to stand up for what you believe in, even if you have to stand alone. Arthenia L. Joyner Ms. Joyner continues to keep a busy schedule and intends to continue her work as an attorney within her community and to serve in private life with the same passion and dedication that she committed to public service. Donald R. Odom Esquire, Pinellas County, Florida Mr. Odom was the first African-American lawyer to work in the legal departments of several government offices in his hometown of the city of St. Petersburg. Mr. Odom was a two-term president of the George Edgecombe Bar Association and the Virgil Hawkins Florida chapter of the National Bar Association. Mr. Odom is a lifelong member of the NAACP and was active in its work in the city of St. Petersburg, including being the chair of the Legal Redress Committee. Milestones along the way for Donald R. Odom. In 1950, he was born in St. Petersburg, Florida. Mr. Odom would go on to live out his formative years in Jacksonville Beach, Florida. In 1974, he enrolled in the University of Florida College of Law as one of very few African-American students. He completed his studies in under three years. Between 1974 and 1985, he would become the first African-American assistant city attorney with the City of St. Petersburg's City Attorney's Office and first African-American Assistant District Counsel with the District 5 Office of the Florida Department of Health and Rehabilitative Services. Between 1985 and 2005, he would serve as a board member for the St. Petersburg Human Relations Board and co-chair of the St. Petersburg Community Alliance and the City of St. Petersburg Charter Review Committee, which played an instrumental role in redistricting to increase fairness and equity in City Council elections. In 2005, after several successful years working at the Hillsborough County Attorney's Office in several positions, including acting county attorney, he retired from the practice of law. Video clip, Donald R. Odom. Well, you know, growing up in Florida, you know, uh, you would think that, uh, you know, I, I did a lot of swimming uh, growing up. And, and I did, I did swim, but, but during those days, uh, black people were, were limited in, in where they could swim. Uh, there was one uh, s uh, public swimming pool in St. Petersburg that, that I could use, and it was called Jenny, Jenny Hall Pool. And there's a, there's a, the history with that is uh, there were no uh, places for, for black people to swim in, in uh, St. Petersburg. Uh, back then. So this white woman whose name was Jenny Hall actually donated the money to build a swimming pool on the south side of St. Petersburg for black people to swim. And, uh, and the, the swimming pool still bears her name. Uh, there was one place that I can recall that we could swim 
down on the bay and it was called the South Mole I think and I have uh, subsequently learned that that was the swimming outlet that was closest to where the city dumped the sewage in those days which of course growing up I knew nothing about that uh, as, a, as a child growing up in Jacksonville I lived 10 blocks from the Atlantic Ocean but we were not allowed to swim in the Atlantic Ocean. So uh, in order to swim, we had to drive over to Fernandina in American Beach. I can barely remember uh, American Beach, but it was, it, 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 from what I understand, it was quite a place. They had black-owned hotels and nightclubs and restaurants. Uh, a whole strip and people would come, well-to-do black people would come from all over the country and, and, vac and vacation there. I understand that a sizable uh, number uh, of, of uh, properties there are still owned by, by black families that have been in, in the families uh, for, for generations. So uh, I, can, I can recall uh, driving back from front of after a day at the beach. It, 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 as I recall, it was because you had to take a ferry, and it was probably like an hour and a half drive, you know. And I can recall uh, driving back late at night, uh, you know, with my family. And if somebody had to go to the bathroom, of course, you had to pull it to the side of the road because you couldn't use like the public facilities. So it was just kind of one of those indignities that you had to get through, you know, in those days when you were, uh, when you were black. A quote, you should enter the profession because you are committed to it and you desire to help others. If you are committed to the profession, you will probably be good at it and the financial regards will eventually come. Donald R. Odom. Mr. Odom is thoroughly enjoying retirement. He frequently travels, plays golf, and stays active in the community and spends time with his family. This is just the beginning. Many more stories like these are waiting to be told. There is a wealth of experience and knowledge in the African American legal community in Tampa Bay. The people behind the journey to Esquire. This project is driven by passionate people who believe in the power of oral history. Director Producer Jocelyn J. Hardrick Esquire, a quote. This project is a labor of love. I get to work with great friends and explore the stories of people I admire while contributing to the rich collection of oral history in my community. Ms. Hardrick has her bachelor's in African and African American Studies from Fordham University. She received her Juris Doctor from the Florida State University College of Law. Ms. Hardrick is admitted to the Florida Bar, to the Middle District of Florida, the Southern District of Florida, and the United States Supreme Court. She is the founder of Diversity Access Pipeline, a nonprofit program dedicated to promoting diversity, creating access, and feeding the pipeline of talented, diverse attorneys and professionals. Consultant Dr. Peter Christian Eigner. Dr. Eigner strives to make knowledge available to the widest possible audience, going far beyond the academic community while still bringing that work directly into local classrooms and learning spaces. He is currently completing his first book, a biography of Daniel Patrick Moynihan, under a contract with Simon & Schuster. Dr. Eigner is Deputy Director of the Gotham Center for New York City History. He is Founder and Managing Editor of Gotham, a blog for scholars of New York City history. He was a dissertation fellow with the Leon Levy Biography Center and a podcast host for new books in history and urban studies. Videographer Ricky Roberts with Ricky Roberts Photography. Where do we go from here? There are many more Journey to Esquire stories to be told. Will you join us on our quest to gather and share them? Contact us for more information. Address P.O. Box 173044. Tampa, Florida, 33672. Phone number, 813-906-6361. Email, journeytoesquire at gmail.com.
I'd like to give a special thanks to all of our supporters, especially our JD level sponsors, U.S. District Courts, Middle District of Florida's Bench Bar Fund, and Agape Christian Bar Preparation Services, Inc., for their generous support. I'd also like to thank WMU Cooley Law School, Tampa Bay Campus, for providing a space for the recording of several of the episodes of this podcast. Thank you. Thanks for tuning in to another great episode of Journey to Esquire, the podcast. Support, share, subscribe. And for more, visit www.journeytoesquire.com.